Hello and welcome. My name is Tamara Taylor and I am the Director of Special Collections at the University of South Florida Libraries. I am pleased to have you join us for today's City of Tampa Archives Awareness Week event, a screening and discussion of the 1950s promotional film, City Within a City. Joining us for the discussion are Andy Hughes of the USF Libraries and Dr. Brad Massey of the Tampa Bay History Center. Andy is a librarian in USF Special Collections, where he specializes in Florida and university history. In addition to helping researchers and scholars, Andy is known for his own research and scholarship. His most recent books include From Saloons to Steakhouses, A History of Tampa, and an upcoming history of the Cuban sandwich. Brad is the History Center's Saunders Foundation Curator of Public History. He is currently completing a book entitled State of Change, a Technological and Social History of Florida. Andy and Brad will join us immediately after the screening, so make sure you have enough popcorn for a full hour of entertainment. But before we get started, please note that this event is being recorded. Live audience participation will be managed through the event's chat feature. You'll also find links to the digitized film, the USF Libraries, the Tampa Bay History Center, and the City of Tampa's Archives Awareness Week in the chat. Access chat by clicking the live event Q&A button in the top right corner of your screen. You can also turn on live captions by clicking CC in the bottom right corner of your screen. If you do not see either button, hover your mouse over the viewing window and click on your screen until the icons appear. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. Florida is famous as a land of sunshine and glistening white beaches, stately palms and exciting tourist attractions, flourishing citrus groves and expanding industry. On the shores of sunny Florida's old Tampa Bay lies a most unusual community, a city within a city. Although now actually a part of Tampa, Ybor City, self-contained settlement of its own. Often referred to as Tampa's Latin Quarter, here is found the architecture of old Spain, Italy, and Cuba, erected by native sons in the pattern of the old countries so close to their hearts. On Ybor City's Broadway are the finest and modern shopping facilities with a variety to suit every taste. This unique community has a population of 45,000 people, practically all of Latin extraction. Contrasting the glittering stores of today, the street bazaars display unusual items, distinctive in originality to lands across the sea. Here is a handmade alligator bag to gladden the heart of any lady. Miniature dolls, fashioned entirely by hand in Mexican, Cuban, and Spanish costumes. Sidewalk bargains of all kinds attract both the tourist and the resident. One is fascinated by this display of imported handmade crockery and china. This modern American community has not forgotten the traditional customs of its forefathers and the Latin languages 
are principally spoken here. You can brush up on your Spanish from the latest movies filmed in Spain, Mexico, and South America. Get your headlines from the Daily Spanish Press. For unusual things to eat, try some of these sherbets, flavors from the tropical fruits of Cuba and South America. Good. Platano bananas, sliced thin and fried to crispy golden chips. A familiar sight on Ybor City streets is the Devil Crab Peddler. With hot sauce, senor? See. Here are delicacies to make your mouth water. Tasty pastries and candy tidbits from recipes from the four corners of the world. From sections of this crisp crusted three foot long Cuban loaf, which you see at the top, the Cuban sandwich is made. With roast beef, baked ham, roast pork, salami, Swiss cheese, mustard, and garnished with pickles, this is a local institution. A five course meal blanketed between huge slabs of pan cubano, Cuban bread. Ybor City's Spanish restaurants are legendary and world famous. A trip to the Latin Quarter would not be complete without visiting these extraordinary dining rooms, resplendently copied from buildings in the Latin countries. With a pride in their establishments, the owners of these fine restaurants have competed in the acquisition of art treasures and furnishings at great cost from Europe and Latin America. As many as seven beautiful dining rooms are found in one of these restaurants. This fountain was imported in sections from Italy and reassembled in this patio. Painstakingly copied in English and Spanish from an early manuscript, the story of Don Quixote with illustrations completely encircles the walls of one room on hand-painted tile. Some of these are originals, and others are copied on small pieces of tile all masterpieces of Latin art. These surroundings transport one to a hacienda in Old Spain or a palacio near Rome. Don't let the atmosphere detract you. The menu is a greater attraction. Here is served chicken prepared 25 different ways and steak in your choice of 15 styles. This is a specialty of the house, 
a roast con pollo, chicken, and yellow rice. Stone crabs are garnished with tomato and parsley. A Tony salad fit for a king. Si, senor, this bar has been in service since 1905. Gracias. In these artistic surroundings are found the finest of wine from native vineyards of Spain, Cuba, and Italy. The splendid patio is always in demand for banquets and large parties. The meal is begun with the traditional sopa de garbanzo, Spanish bean soup. The chicken casserole is a vision of taste, unaffected by mass production and handling. Even the after-dinner speaker is not hard to take following a feast like this. In 1885, Senor Vincent Martinez Ebor and others came to Tampa seeking a new site for their cigar factories and founded Ebor City. Cuban, Spanish, and Italian workers thronged to the new settlement. Here is the early wood-burning locomotive which carried passengers between Tampa and Ybor City. The Broadway of the late 1800s was a far cry from the modern business street of today, but as of old, cigar workers still crowd the entrances of the cigar factories. Cigar making is still the principal industry, and the factories, the largest of their kind in the country, employ thousands. The world-famous Tampa cigars are made in Ybor City, and visitors are always welcome in the factories for a first-hand look and even a sample freshly made. The making of fine, handmade cigars has changed little since the inception. Fine Havana and American tobaccos are carefully sorted and inspected. The filler is skillfully assembled by expert hands and placed in a mold which will hold its shape. It is then rolled in the outside wrapper leaf. Coronas, Royals, Perfectos, and Panatellas are produced, termed by the various sizes, shapes, and qualities. The machine has not replaced the skillful hand, but has increased production to an unbelievable figure. Over 700 million cigars produced here last year. This machine punches, bands, and puts on the familiar cellophane wrapper, the final step direct to the box. Of course, the federal tax stamps must be applied and the box sealed. This is not a display. These young ladies stack the boxes with air spaces between them until the glue dries to prevent sticking. Also important in Ybor City is Florida's citrus industry. Located in the center of the rich citrus land, many canning plants are in operation. Fruit is unloaded, graded, sorted, and washed. Packing is done both by hand and machine. It takes millions of cans which are made in huge factories near the processing plant. Precision machinery is designed for fast and low-cost production. Here are large meat packing plants producing both fresh and canned meat products under the most sanitary conditions. This large cement plant figures importantly in the commerce of the state. Giant seagoing ships of all nations steam into old Tampa Bay, discharge freight, 
then load with local products for transportation to American and foreign ports. From the Latin American countries come smaller vessels with fruit for transshipment to all parts of the nation. These luscious green bananas will ripen on the way to your table. This is the home port of one of Florida's largest shrimp fleets. Thousands of pounds of shrimp are processed and quick frozen for shipment all over the United States. Here's the making of a lot of shrimp cocktail. Some ships tarry for repairs and refitting in the well-equipped shipyards and then move out to sea once again. Ybor City's famous clubs play an important part in the lives of its citizens. Originally formed to aid their members with sickness and hospitalization insurance, these are noted for special social events and gay nightlife. The people of Ybor City were deeply involved in the struggle for Cuban liberation. This beautiful Cuban club is dedicated to Jose Marti, the father of Cuban independence. Marti spent much time in the Latin Quarter conferring and speaking with his supporters. This is the Centro Asturiano Club, a branch of the mother club in Havana, boasting a combined membership of over 50,000. And it is both a welfare and social organization. This stage show is one of the many regular festivities. Bagpipes have been native to the mountains of Spain for centuries. This dance at the Cuban Club celebrates the anniversary of Cuban Independence Day. And it's not hard to fall into the spirit of things. Having ruled throughout the year, it is time for the queen of the Cuban Club to end her reign and pass it to her successor. The new queen ascends the throne to accept the crown, to preside over for the coming year. It's fiesta time for the NPU at the annual Halloween festival. The small fry twirl their batons, accompanied by the VM Ebor school band. It's really hard to select the most colorful and unusual costume. And of course, there must be a king and queen of Halloween. And a complete court in attendance. The people of Ybor City are active in their civic sports program and go all out to the old park to cheer their favorites as local teams fight it out. Several times during the season, visiting teams come from Cuba and seats are at a premium. In this huge concrete fronton building seating 3,500, the game of pie lie is played, much as it was 500 years ago in old Spain. 
the basket fastens to the player's hand and is called a cesta. With it, the ball is thrown against a concrete wall 175 feet away and caught on the rebound, often reaching a speed of over 150 miles an hour. It's no wonder this is called the fastest game in the world, and it's a dangerous one, often resulting in injuries to the players. Players come here from Spain, Mexico, and other Latin countries to compete for prize money, with many from Cuba, where high lie is the national sport. Sports and recreation are also important in the lives of the young people and regular swimming lessons for beginners are featured at this magnificent outdoor pool. Florida's warm climate makes this a favorite pastime most of the months of the year. At the Ybor City branch of the Boys Club, young men spend hours that would otherwise be idle in supervised sports and recreation and the summer camp during vacation months is eagerly awaited. It's not hard to work off some of that youthful energy on the trampoline, and it takes considerable skill to become an expert. In the game room, both players and spectators actually become a part of each contest, and many hours are spent in efforts to become champions. There's nothing like a refreshing shower after one of these workouts. In the shops, valuable training is received in the crafts and arts, and many of these youngsters often select a trade as a result of this primary experience. One of the main attractions here is the camera club and dark room, where the mysteries of photography are explored. It's election time in Ybor City, and keen campaigns for alcalde or mayor are in full swing. Here's an example of Latin imagination and civic pride as candidates outdo each other with promises. It's all in fun as the community is actually under the administration of Greater Tampa, but this campaign sometimes stirs up real controversies. During election week, the flag of Ybor City flies over the festivities and tremendous quantities of specially issued money is passed out by the candidates. At the Alcalde's Ball, the outgoing mayor makes his farewell speech, surrounded by his cabinet. The new Alcalde is sworn in. The settlement's variety of nationalities is represented here by the costumes of many countries. Notable are Dutch, Greek, Italian, Spanish, and American Indian. Traditional folk dances of old Spain are faithfully performed. Famous for their old world atmosphere, the clubs of Ybor City attract dozens of national conventions annually 
Starting with the delicious meal of chicken and yellow rice, delegates are serenaded and supplied with local made cigars by the beautiful senoritas in attendance. And the floor show is something to write home about. Dancing on an international pattern from mambo to waltz time. In February, during the Florida State Fair Week, all Ybor City takes time out for a day of celebration. Visitors are treated to a free bowl of the famous Spanish bean soup, complete with Cuban bread. Traffic is stopped on Broadway while native musicians entertain. The finishing touch is a gigantic night parade as pirate Jose Gaspar takes over the city in his annual invasion. This mammoth procession lasts over two hours and attracts thousands of spectators from throughout the country. Top-notch bands come hundreds of miles to take part in the gala celebration. Floats cost hundreds of dollars to build, are carefully designed, and often take a whole year to construct. come from all parts of the nation and usually include some from Cuba and other Latin countries. After witnessing the Gasparilla Night Parade, it is not hard to understand why it is a long anticipated feature in the life of the colony. In April, the community heralds the Latin American fiesta with the Queen's presentation of gifts to the members of her court as the ceremonies are broadcast throughout the nation on radio and television networks. <music> Bidding farewell to her loyal subjects, she surrenders the crown and abdicates in favor of the new queen. 
who will she be? The crowd holds their breath as no one yet knows which of the ten candidates will be chosen. The blushing selectee, with tears in her eyes, marches proudly forward with her escort to accept the honor of which many young ladies dream. Visiting royalty, the king and queen of Tampa's Gasparilla. And a visiting dignitary from Puerto Rico. Gaiety and laughter prevail in the royal command performance. The Queen is an ambassador to carry the goodwill of Tampa's Latin colony to the Latin countries she will visit in the year to come. A fitting finale to a gay year in the lives of a gay people in Ybor City, the city within a city. Hey, what a, what a cool look back into the mid 1950s. Um, this is Andy Hughes uh, from USF Libraries. And I'm here with uh, with Brad Massey. Um, and uh, first of all, you know, uh, Brad, one of the reasons why I asked you to join us today was because your, your dissertation really focuses on post-war Tampa and kind of different strategies for, uh, for Tampa to kind of market itself and to stay successful and in the game. So what, what are some of the takeaways from this video? Um, <laughs> well, the, well, the video is awesome. I mean, we'll find out about that. But the, the most interesting thing about the video is it gets created, Andy, at this time where Tampa's trying to reinvent itself. You know, it had been this industrial town that produced cigars, that produced phosphate. Um, but all of a sudden, America's changing and you have this consumer economy and you have the, a tourist economy so tampa's like well how can we tap into that and still do some of these other things and one of the things they try to do is say well let's talk up our latinness right and so they invent um the senorita you see a lot of senoritas in this film and they right. you know they kind of try to want to bring the sensuality of the senorita to bring it to Ybor. And then you still have a lot of women working in the cigar factories. About 90% of the cigar factory employees at this time were women in the 1950s. Right. And 50% um, of them are their home's primary breadwinner. So these are important factory jobs. So the senorita and women that are working in, still working in these cigar factories are a good example of, you know, Tampa trying to do all these different things at different times. And at times in the video, it seems like they don't know what they want to show people. And right. so that kind of speaks to this, this city that has this identity that's based on all these different things, right? This Latin past that now they're trying to make a, a tourist or a tourist commodity, but then also continuing cigar making and apparently a YMCA too. And <laughs> all kinds of things anymore. Well, it's also kind of incongruous because, you know, a lot of the tourist films at the time really play up the sun and fun of Florida, water. And, you know, Tampa is a very industrial city at the time, really still. Yeah. No, it is, and that's the struggle. I mean, you want to bring people to Ebor, but what are you going to do? You're not going to stay a couple nights. I mean, you're going to eat some Spanish bean soup, apparently. You're going to have yourself a sandwich, a double crap from a guy on the side of the street, and then you're going to go on your way. Right. Um, but they're still trying to package this. And as you know, you know, later on, they try to bring bullfighting to Ebor. They try to do all these things, but it never quite catches on. You know, Bush Gardens catches on north of us um, here in downtown Tampa. And Bush Gardens is going to be the number one Florida tourist destination before the Mouse House opens up in the early 1970s. Um, but even it, you know, it's not a place where you're actually going to stay in town for a few days. You just right. can't visit it. So, yeah, it's this this attempt to do all these different things and, you know, to try to sell Tampa. You know, what are we going to sell? Well, this idea that Bush Gardens might have some sort of synergy with Ybor City, but then it chooses a dark continent theme, you know, which is a whole world away. So, um that's yeah, interesting. The other thing besides the senoritas that really pops out is um, it's all the food, of course. Yeah. And um, 
you know, it's interesting because as early as the 1940s, you know, the city leaders are saying, you know, as, as soon as people have eaten in the restaurants in Ybor City, what else do they have to do? You know, and they end up kind of walking around and looking at things and that's about it. And it's interesting because um, the things that they chose to, to feature in this film aren't really very tourist friendly. I mean, this idea of going to like the public pool you know, or going to a Halloween pageant or something like that, you know, it's, it's, so it's interesting as a film because it's sort of like a profile of a community rather than like an opportunity for tourists to participate in something or get out there and spend money, you know, um, it, it seems strange that way. It is strange. You know, you and I were talking before we viewed the film tonight. Um, there's another film called We Discovered Cameron, Andy. I mean, he loves all these things. Right. So he decides to relocate his business down here. So the message of that film is really clear, but the right. message of this film is, is sort of unclear. What is it that they want? And one thing you and I talked about is there's a lot of groups that aren't depicted, you know, here. Um, so what are some of those people that, you know, we know are really important to the history of Tampa and Ybor City, and they just, they just don't show up in the film? Right, yeah, you wouldn't know that Afro-Cubans exist, for example, or that there's an African American community here. Um, you know, this is right about the time of you know Brown versus the Board of Education decision. You know, um, so that gets completely sort of glossed over. Um, and then, of course, you know the idea that there's you know um, that there are unions. There still were unions in Ymir City. This is something that's really not discussed, even though it was a real. Well, I mean, first of all, symptomatic of the industrial experience, yeah. but also, you know, of the Latin experience, you know, um, uh, you know, a high degree of like political and labor awareness. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, you have the Senorita, which you're using to try to sell the tourist economy. And then, as I said earlier, um, the vast majority of cigar workers are women and they're making a lot of money. It's going to be a strike in 1962 at the Corral Wadisca factory and the police are going to arrest 15 people and over half of them are women. And so, yeah, you still have this industrial economy where you have strikes, and that strike is pretty nasty. Um, somebody gets a shotgun fired at their house. Um, there's paint that is thrown on cars, on um, scabs, cars that are trying to break the strike. But yeah, we don't see any of that sort of industrial reality, you know, here in this video. Right. Um, I, I, not that you would necessarily expect it to, but it's also interesting that they're saying that the machines have been compromised. Yeah. You know, the handmade quality of cigars, it's like, well, that's what machines do. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, so that's interesting as well. Um, so I guess whether it succeeds as a, as a promotional film or not is, is up for debate, certainly. Um, you know, one thing that it definitely exceed, you know, excels at is a kind of an exercise in nostalgia. Oh, yeah. You know, and what's so interesting about it is almost the naivety of this film that, you know that here is this this really distinctive community that it's that's portraying that's about to go under the gun essentially of, of urban renewal. You know, there's about to be a whole lot of demolition. Um, you know, Ebor was slowly kind of slipping into poverty at that time, and and all the people who had money were moving to the suburbs. So, um, so it's it is a snapshot of Ebor right before things are about to go wrong. And like early on in the film, you see the Mercedes cafeteria. Um, or at least the sign for the Mercedes cafeteria, which will be gone a few years later uh, because of urban renewal. And that's really like a, a canary in the coal mine because that's where regular working people could afford to eat lunch. And right about the time that it closed, Morrison's was closing downtown, um, which is another real disaster if you think about how popular Morrison's had been uh, downtown before that. So things are changing really quickly. Um, and there are all kinds of things in this film that are that you no longer see. And when's the last time you saw a devil crab bed on the street, which used to be, you know, one of those things that you always saw in Ebor City, kind of like roosters today. You still see the roosters. Um, yeah, no, it's true. So it's just work in nostalgia. One thing I wanted to say is if anybody has any questions, Andy and I are going to do a short Q&A. So absolutely. Feel free to submit your questions. And I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what you were saying. And I had said this to you while we were watching the film. It's kind of sad because, you know, you're, you're watching really what is the end of a community. We know that in retrospect. Right. Because urban renewal is going to come down and literally knock down the infrastructure, large swaths of it, of Ybor City. 
So it's funny, it's not funny, but it's interesting in that they're trying to make their neighborhood and their culture attractive, literally trying to turn it into a tourist commodity. And at the same time, it's getting ready to get knocked down in about seven short years, maybe roughly after this, this film is made. Right. You know, and at about the same time, all those other kind of restaurants are closed and the Columbia stop serving lunch. They, they can't even get enough people, you know, in the, the dining rooms for lunch for, for them to be, even be open. But then there's also some of the other glimpses of great restaurants like Spanish Park, the Las Novedadas. Um, then the other thing that we, you know, sadly is gone is the shrimp fleets. The idea that there would be shrimp trawlers in the bay anymore is, um, you know, it's it's decades, you know, out of reach now. Um, so that's another thing. High lies, another thing that is come, come and gone. Um, so. It, it really it does kind of tug at the heartstrings as well, you know, and the, the folk dancing and the folk music that was portrayed as well is like, you probably don't see that very often. There's not many people who can even do those dances and play those instruments anymore. Um, certainly the social clubs are still with us, but they're all struggling. Um, so, uh, so for that reason, it's definitely a bittersweet um, film as well. Yeah, absolutely. But um, so this is a good time for us to, to turn it over to Christina Wise. She's the development officer for USF Libraries, and she's going to moderate the Q&A for us and, uh, and take us out with some comments. Christina? Awesome. Thanks so much, Andy. And once again, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to type them in the chat. We, we have had a few come through. Um, do we know what happened to this once very prominent community and culture in Ebor? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we've just been discussing. I mean, urban renewal was a big, um, you know, was a big part of, you know, the, but, you know, by the time urban renewal co had come in, there was a reason why. It's because the community itself had, you know, was facing poverty. A lot of people, you know, former immigrant families who are into their second, third, sometimes fourth generations, they're all moving out into the suburbs because they're getting better jobs. They're, they're not working in the cigar factories anymore, especially the men, as, as uh, Brad pointed out. So there's a lot of different, you know, dynamics going on. And of course, inner cities everywhere in post, post-war post America are all falling apart. So downtown, the same thing was happening, you know, and we act like Central Avenue, you know, the Black Business District was sort of getting special treatment, but everything was falling apart. I mean, the, the inner cities everywhere were, were um, definitely decaying. So. It's, it's a big problem. And then, of course, you have the interstates coming through. There's just there's there's all kinds of issues going on. So and some of them are good. You know, people are moving out because they're they're getting wealthier, but people are no longer interested in investing in that community. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you think of Ebor, it's really a, a really hard defined community, hard in the sense that it has clear borders, right, as a Cuban enclave, and then there's a lot of African Americans that are starting to move in, you know, right after the war. And then that kind of goes away with the suburbs and the interstates, as you say. And the GI Bill is a good example. You know, the GI Bill is famous because of its housing benefits. A lot of those benefits are for new homes, right? And that's going to encourage a lot of people to move out into the suburbs as well. So I, I think it's a mix of policy um, by policymakers, and then also a changing economy, as Andy said. You know, there's going to be malls that start to pop up right around this time, and people right. are going to move out of the city centers. And a lot of those Ebor storefronts, you saw them shopping at the beginning, right? The clothing store. I thought that was really interesting. Right. You know, those a lot of those in Ebor are going to go away. So I think just the economy, there's policies, and you know, this this immigrant enclave really changes a lot. Yeah, well, and there's also this idea that the, the cohesion that once held it together is is unraveling too. You know, as people get more money, as, as families start to move elsewhere and kind of separate. So oh, there's and, a lot of things going on. Yeah, we almost forgot. Um, you know, you got the Cuban embargo. So when it comes to the cigar industry, we have all these women that are working. These are good jobs, right? Half of them are their home breadwinners. Um, but when that clear Havana tobacco dries up, you're going to see employment numbers drop from about five to six thousand to three to four thousand. So those jobs are going to be undercut. And you know, as you and I were talking about before, Tampa was known for making high-end Cuban cigars. Right. And that bled down into some of the cheaper factories as well. They would say, "Well, we're Tampa cigars too." Well, sure, which are twenty-five cent cigars, but right. the whole Tampa branding apparatus was based on Cuban tobacco. When Kennedy signs the embargo order and that tobacco starts to dry up, we see the industry dry up even more. 
Right, absolutely. Do we have any other questions? Any any comments out there? Well, we did have a nice comment saying, what a wonderful piece of early history. Thank you for sharing, and I do agree. And we had another question come in, and if somebody wanted to experience the culture that we see here today, where would you all recommend going in Ebor? Well, I, first of all, I recommend going to West Tampa. Um, I would go to West Tampa first because it's really um, less affected, I think, by kind of uh, modern development and things. So you still have things like botanicas there, um, you know, uh, different stores like that. So I think I might start in West Tampa and check out the scene over there. Um, Definitely. I mean, so much of it is just driving around and just stopping where places look interesting. So um, I think that I would start there. Um, and then in Ebor, I don't know, what do you think? I mean, I think a stroll down 7th Ave is always good for everyone because it mixes the old and the new. Right. I mean, it mixes nightlife. You know, anybody that went to college in the 80s and 90s knows, well, yeah, you go to Ebor to get hammered, right? So you know, it mixes <laughs> the club atmosphere. But then there's still some rollers and then still on the outskirts of kind of what people consider Ebor, you still do have one factory, right? right. You've got the Newman factory out there. And that's everybody should drive past the Newman factory, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you get that sense of what Tampa was when it had these grandiose factories. The other thing is if you ever hear about an event happening at one of the social clubs, I highly recommend going. The Italian club is amazing. There's been so much work put into these clubs to uh, not only to keep them standing, but to make them beautiful. So if you ever get a chance to go to the Centro Asturiano Theater for an event, go to the Cuban Club, any of these places uh, are amazing. You know, um, to me, it's amazing to me that the Cuban Club had kind of fallen into disrepair and in the late 70s, early 80s. It was the place to see punk rock in Tampa uh, for a long time afterwards. And it's kind of crazy to think that. But, um, but now, even today, uh, Tropical Heat Wave is a good example of 88.5 uh, does a uh, music festival that's um, you know centered in Ebor City. So um, so yeah, there's there's still other things to explore, and I think food is the one thing that's kind of outlasted all the other things. So thankfully, we still have some some decent places to eat. I also think that um, Columbus Avenue is is also worth checking out, and if you're interested in kind of the new Latin uh, cuisine and immigration, then Armenia is the place to go. Lots and lots of Colombian, Peruvian restaurants, things like that. Yeah, so and Andy's a food historian, so if I can ask you a question real quick, okay. kind of piggybacking on that earlier question, if you could pick like a dish or two for people to go out and try, whether it be in West Tampa or Ebor or wherever they might end up, right. what would you pick? That is tough. Is there anything pops to mind? Well, that's tough. It all depends who you are and how much experience you have. Like if you don't have much experience with Cuban food, I think you pick a Dio is great, but it's hard to find a can be hard to find like you know an excellent version um and then of course like the cuban sandwich is hit or miss i mean i'm a big lover of the cuban sandwich but i also think it could be a lot better in most cases so um that can be a tough one um you know i'd say chicken and yellow rice but once again uh you know some of these dishes haven't aged as well as others and there's it's complex chicken and yellow rice is very complex but it basically comes down to the chickens are huge and you have to overcook the rice in order to cook the chickens. Yeah. And that's a calculus that restaurants haven't really adjusted too much yet. Um, I think one big thing, you know, pro tip at home, just cut your, your breasts in half when you're making, you know, chicken and yellow rice, and then your breasts are going to cook at, you know, the same rate as your other stuff. So right. I'm sorry, I'm not giving a good answer because I think a lot of the yeah. go-to dishes, we were just talking about paella earlier. Yeah. And I often find paella to be, Kind of disappointing it all depends so um but i i think all right here's a good one salteado yeah. any kind of salteado whether you're at a good restaurant or a kind of a blue plate special restaurant a salteado is always excellent it's kind of like a fricassee with um you know your protein and potatoes and things like that it's got some chorizo in there um, and i love spanish bean soup i'm still a huge uh, fan and a huge fan of caldo gallego which is a white bean soup made with turnip greens and potatoes. Um, both of those are great. And, you know, every time I make caldo gallego, I'm always wondering, like, how could it be so good? It's like five ingredients, yeah. but it's it's always amazing. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I... That was my fault. I pushed on the side. So, yeah. <laughs>
Any other questions, comments? Yeah, we had another question come in. What does the term urban renewal refer to? Is that related to terms like gentrification, urban decay, or urban okay. flood? And did those things affect Ybor City? Right. So, okay. So, urban renewal is an actual program. So, it's not like a euphemism or, you know, a theory or something like that. Urban renewal was a, an actual federal program. So, the idea was that the market had failed some places, um, and especially the inner city. So, the, you know, these inner cities were falling on a hard time. So, the idea of urban renewal was that the federal government would pay to clear the land. And then that would sort of make it easier to, for it to be redeveloped. I mean, is this about right? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's things called urban renewal, the model cities plan. This right. idea that you're going to go and you're going to knock down urban renewal, you're going to destroy and you're going to renew. This right. is a good way to think about urban renewal, though. It does much more destroying than it does renewing. That's why when you drive through Ebor, you see a lot of empty parcels. That's why you had mentioned right. the Central Avenue District, which was, you know, the heart of the African-American community in Tampa. Urban renewal destroys almost all of it right. and then runs an intersection, an interstate right there. Because um, interstates are related to urban renewal, but they are different programs. But right. yeah, so just piggybacking on Andy. So, you know, you have urban renewal and then, you know, gentrification is kind of a concept that comes a little bit later, I think, Andy, when we think about it in the terms of American history. And that's kind of the movement, particularly of white suburban um, residents back into inner cities. And at the moment this film is made, the reverse is happening, right. I would argue. Right. So we don't see gentrification happen till later, and it happens after urban renewal is, you know, really considered a bust. Right. right. So it's the idea that the, the federal government could come in and clear the playing field, make it cheaper for someone to build something new there. And of course, what happened is the market determined that these weren't desirable in the first place. So when you knock the building down, it doesn't make it any more desirable, really. You know, so people weren't buying property and building stuff because it was still in the middle of a not a great neighborhood, you know. Yeah, and you know what was determined to be a property not worth saving oftentimes had racist undertones. There's right. no doubt about it. Right. I mean, the, the notion it's much more easy to go in and then this is at the end of Jim Crow, right? right? And knock down black establishments, black homes, and black buildings, and we see that play out in Ebor City as well. Right. So the the market would, wouldn't just flood back in afterwards. And then the other thing that's interesting is everyone imagined that interstates were going to be these like on ramps into the city and everyone would just would, would, would just stop in Tampa as they're going by. And of course, that's not true. Everyone is trying to get to Georgia or Tennessee or wherever they're going. Um, and that all those interstates became off ramps, you know, for people to leave the city and for businesses to leave the city and to access areas farther away in the suburbs. So um, it was definitely a, a, a double edged sword there. Yeah. But, uh, any other comments or questions? It's definitely a lot of fun. It's a really yeah. cool film. This, this will be our last question. Okay. Uh, what was the housing like in Ybor City? Were there mostly apartments or houses? In the time depicted in the video, did most people in Ybor live close to the cigar factories and social clubs that they went to, or did they commute? Yeah, most of them live close. I mean, Ybor is a community where your house is right there. And obviously, before automobiles, you could walk or jump on the streetcar and be right there. So it's that traditional industrial neighborhood where you build the factory and then you build the homes around it. And that's why Ebor is really interesting in that if you look at old photos of it, Andy, as you know, you'll see a factory homes, a factory homes, and then the streetcar will allow workers to get a little farther away. Right. Um, but of course, streetcar service stops in Tampa in 1946. And so that's going to be another thing that really changes the nature of like, right. the urban core. Yeah, there's just layers of things happening here. Yeah. Yeah, so mostly single family homes, you know, a lot of small casitas, right? These, these little homes right. that were made for workers, um, which by the 1950s and 60s, a lot of them are getting old, right? And right. Well, I mean, people say that, that really, I mean, a lot of the original company housing that was built when Ebor moved in had already been torn down at the turn of the century because they hadn't even been painted. So, you know, they didn't last very long, these wooden houses. In the 1930s, we had a whole nother round of houses getting destroyed. They were infested with termites and stuff. So there were some uh, original or old casitas left at this point, but that's the way most people were living. There weren't condos. There was no yeah. apartments really to speak of, uh, except for a few like above businesses in the old buildings. Yeah. But uh, 
But anyway, this is a, a it's good. Thank you for joining us, Brad. Yeah, it's my and pleasure. Thanks Thank to the all. Tampa Bay History Center. And I'm going to pass things back off to Christina and tomorrow. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight and also for participating with all of your great questions. And if any of you would like to support the libraries and or get more information about our collections, please feel free to contact myself or Special Collections, and I will put the links to both of our websites in the chat. And now I will hand it back over to Tamara Taylor, our Director of Special Collections. Thank you, Christina, and thank you everyone for joining us. We really hope you enjoyed today's event. Please visit the USF Libraries YouTube channel for this recording and other USF Libraries programming. We look forward to seeing you at future programs.